All right, so we're going to look at the uh, aftermath of Black Death today, the world after. Look at the Statute of Laborers, the Jacquerie Revolt, Chomping, Italian term, Italian uh, Rebellion, the Peasants' Revolt, also known as Watt Tyler's Rebellion in 1381, the Hundred Years' War, uh, about the Asian Corps, and look at the role of Joan of Arc, Pope Boniface the Eighth. And uh, creating problems in the church, the Hand Sanctum, the Avignon Papacy, and the Great Schism. Any questions on that? Well, the plague has passed. New day has uh, dawned. Now what? I did pass on the they just killed all the uh the of the how did they do really? Yeah, so, yeah, twenty five million people are dead in Europe a third of the population and it's uh, of course, you always have some kind of residual problems after people dying in kind of a infections from uh, all the rotting flesh everywhere. It's always a health issue. Great plagues, and that's followed by many, many plagues. And so, is the throwing people at other people's kingdoms and stuff like that? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, it's actually uh, an excellent story from this. It's kind of a morbid story, but. Uh, one of the earliest uses of biological warfare was during this time period, 1348. Uh, the Mongols were laying siege to the city of Kaffa uh, on the Black Sea. Tartars were defending it. At, uh, and what happened was, uh, they, so the plague had struck there. They decided to, uh, the best way to uh, defend the city would be to Fling the body of plague victims over the walls to effect invade the besieging army. Mm -hmm. Of course, the besieging army did get sick. But they ended up losing that battle anyway. Because here, here's the thing about biological warfare is it can't be controlled. Actually, you can't program little sol little uh, uh, microscopic soldiers to just your side. Once you release it, it's out of your control. And, uh, so it happens in war. You're entering into enemy territory. Territory that you have just infected. And you have now just exposed your soldiers to. You capture enemy soldiers. They come in contact with enemy soldiers. It means you have yourself have just been infected. Once your people are infected, they start infecting more of your people. So whatever temporary advantage you may have bought by unleashing uh, an epidemic, it's going to backfire back on you. So that's why biological warfare has never been widely used. It's just unpredictable and uncontrollable. There's never been any kind of a advantage in any kind of war. It's a moral it's a banned by international treaty. Um, exit the, uh, there's an instance in the French and Indian War that uh, the British gave uh, several of the Native American allies of the French blankets that had been uh, used by uh, smallpox patients, but uh, they caused several smallpox epidemics but, uh, within these Native American tribal communities. But did it have an overall effect on the uh, outcome of the war? No. The tribes were losing anyway. Um, that's why some people uh, a little too panicked about uh, some aspects of terrorism, which is an awful thing. But like I said biological warfare is just not something an intelligent or sane person would use. Because suppose you have somebody way out some isolated part of the world. <coughs> So they're going to launch a biological attack on the West. We'll say bubonic plague or anthrax. 
serious diseases, deadly diseases, but here's the problem. These diseases are quickly identified, easily treatable, antibiotics, anthrax, antibiotics. If you catch it. Yeah, if you catch it in time, but, here, but uh, in the early stages of these diseases, it's treatable, easily treatable. In the later stages, a little more trouble, but it can be treated. Uh, and each nation and international organizations, they have organizations in their countries to track diseases and epidemics. Centers for Disease Control, the United States World Health Organization, uh, through the United Nations, and all these individual nations having their own versions of it. Doctors talk to doctors all the time. They're able to identify these uh, symptoms in hospitals. So a lot of people might get sick, but they'd catch it very early before casualties really got to be very high. But of course, that epidemic is spreading. And of course, you got people traveling overseas, traveling back to the areas where this stuff was first released. Guess what the problem is? The problems of the area of the world today with such high or such terrorism inmates from these are areas with some of the worst medical care in the country. They'd be unleashing it under their own people. They couldn't stop it. One of the more bizarre things about this whole age we live in, uh, the border area between Afghanistan and Pakistan. They have them traded with terrorist activity, Al-Qaeda, uh, Taliban, and so forth. Uh, and one of the international relief efforts today is... Uh, been trying to vaccinate children against polio. Polio is a deadly disease, been eradicated in 99% of the world, like three, two or three countries left where it even exists because of mass vaccination efforts. This disease killed thousands of people. And one of the other things it did was cause uh, people survived it, they would probably be paralyzed for the rest of their lives from the waist down or completely paralyzed to neck down. Paralysis is one of the side effects of this disease, as it basically tore down your nervous system. So here's what they're doing: is uh, they're trying to stop their own people from being vaccinated against a disease that causes paralysis. They're trying to disrupt those vaccination efforts. Now, tell me what kind of sense that makes. None. They're shooting themselves in the foot. The problem with zealotry is it has its own circular logic that exists only in its own imagination. It really doesn't act logically. It doesn't act rationally. Basically, the ends and the means become one and the same intertwined where they're basically you have no morals or core principles. It's simply inflicting pain on the enemy. And eventually, that turns on itself. The terrorist movements, they may be violent, bloody, but they're rarely successful. Because the same forces will always turn on themselves. Now look at what happened in Egypt. Uh, the uh, Muslim Brotherhood briefly came to power, but they proved they couldn't, they couldn't manage the government. They couldn't manage all the different factions within the country. What happened? The military got tired of them over the rule. Taliban very nearly took over all of Afghanistan. What happened? Constant series of civil wars. They couldn't manage the government. They couldn't control all the factions. They tried to uh, expand outward and attack the rest of the world. The rest of the world attacked, disrupted them. They lost everything. It's still, they're still there, but the problem was they still had more their lessons. They could maintain control. Didn't, because these movements didn't realize that there's more to their country than just their movement. There are more interests in their country than just their interests. 
general, they might be able to seize power by terror and violence. They could not maintain it. So, they will not succeed at the end. Historical pattern. Anyway, back to the principle, those who cannot remember history are condemned to repeat it. Now, going back in time, how do you put the world back together? So this is the... Of course, trouble this focus today. Is, um... You've got the world has basically been wiped out. Millions dead. Whole villages and cities abandoned. So, you are one of the few survivors. How are you going to put the world back together? So, why isn't there some attempt by various little warlords and kings and uh, try to take over enemy territories? Because these little wannabe kings and small areas, they don't have any kind of power. Everyone's just interested in survival. Why aren't kings trying, other countries trying to take over other countries since their neighbors are so weak? They're just as weak. They're just trying to hold on to what they have. So does anyone have any military now? They do, but it's very, very weak. You know, they just, your manpower is greatly depleted. Everybody's is. Yeah, I remember going around and invading other places just seems like it would affect more people. Exactly. That's why they stopped the Hundred Years' War in the middle of this, because they realized a big epidemic's coming, they need to stop for a while. <laughs> um, Best thing to do is isolate yourself. Yeah. 40% of the peasant population died. That's the bulk of your military forces. Which means that half of them, half your population, was infected and showed symptoms. That 10% that had it uh, managed to survive barely. The other half, large portions of them probably exposed but never developed symptoms. Some kind of natural immunity. That happens with every epidemic. You have some people who just are not... Uh, susceptible to it. You may say it in your own family sometimes. Everybody else comes down to the cold except that one person. Or everybody gets that stomach virus except that one person. But they get the next one. Mm-hmm. And just luck of the draw. Natural selection. So, you're trying to put the world back together. You're trying to, have to make it Rebuild some semblance of order, something you do recognize. And people are trying to put their lives back together in different ways, but not necessarily in the ways other people want them to. Remember, there's people who had vested interest in the ways the way that things were before. They want to turn the clock back before the plague, but too much has happened. It's not going to go back. We're talking about the sociological effects of mass epidemics on societies. The people are going to change. The perspective has been changed because they've faced so much loss. Their behavior has changed because they're used to trying to avoid certain things. I talk about people trying to avoid black cats or uh, people who uh, are the ring around the rosy nursery rhymes, trying to make some kind of sense out of it. And just reducing it to the game. What's happened economically, though, is your labor force is reduced, customer base is reduced, trade is reduced, and they have these mass labor shortages in different areas. Now, look on the uh, feudal manners. What if the uh, feudal lord died? There he goes their separate ways. No one can keep him there anymore. 
Um, or they hear there's work, uh, uh, not enough people to keep them on the manors. Peasants will just go to the cities, try to find work there. A lot of people looking for specific skills, can't find anybody to do it. Well, they do. They'll pay you whatever money you're willing to take for it. If if so many people dying within a family, what happens? Inheritance. One person inherits another, and another, another. You might be the only survivor in a family of 20, 30 people, uh, including all the cousins and everything. What happens is you're the sole legal survivor. You're the one who gets everything. Which means you might have a little extra money in your pocket. But... uh, Suppose you are the surviving manorial lord. Your workforce is leaving because why should they stay? You don't have the force to keep them there. They're making more money somewhere else, but you pay them that money to stay. That's cutting into your profit margins. Plus the fact all these crops are producing for you to sell. Who are you going to sell it to? A third of your customers are dead. That's cutting your margins too. So there's this significant economic disruption. <clears throat> Give me an example here. What's happening for the peasants is give me higher um, standards of living and come out of this. <clears throat> More choices in work, so forth. Higher wages, inheritance, and so forth. Cuts of manor in England. Thirteen forty seven. Laborers were making two shillings a week. Basically, deadly squat. We look at our map here on page 310 to see them, uh, where everything's passing through. Uh, plague hits England in late 1348. Moves into Scotland and Ireland by 1349. Basically, here in southern England, by 1349, it's mostly passed. But still the going around, but the most devastating effects were already hit. Nobody can do the work for them. So they'll get somebody, anybody to pay any wage to get it done, because it has to be done. So 1349, wages here are now seven shillings a week. So they can do the same job. And just because you live, you now have a 450% raise. A little extra income. Pretty nice. 1350, even higher because of the disruptions in the economy finally uh, now shaking out. 11 shillings a week. Five and a half times what you were making just a couple years earlier. It's that way all over England. This is just one example. Job has got to be done. You've got to pay them whatever way you can to get them to do it. Your boys to do it. Here's the thing also. They're still producing just as much, but because you have still a fairly large supply of uh, agricultural products, grains and so forth, but fewer customers, it is less demand, prices are falling. So you're paying less for food, making a lot more money, and you've got extra spending money. It's really good for you if you're a worker. But if you're the guy who owns this place, that's not good for you. And of course, since he's the landowner, he's got all the political power. So how are they profiting if they're paying their workers more and selling their... The problem is a lot of them aren't. Then why are they doing it? They're caught in the cycle of supply and demand. You kind of understand something too about uh, because you have a business or because you own property, something like this doesn't necessarily mean you're a good businessman. <laughs> yeah, I can go all over town here and I can see just horrible fundamental mistakes people are making with their businesses. But uh, 
right. So having the good idea and having the skills one thing, but being able to market it, do it, something else. It's the next step you have to take. So if you do have a, a skill, a particular skill, you might be able to market one day or go in your own business with. Take a couple of business classes too, to make sure you know how to really market good and right. These guys didn't. They needed the labor. And they're still basically still stuck in 1346. They're still thinking the market's the same. This price is going to come back, but I still need all this labor to do it, and I still got to pay all these. <coughs> got to pay them this wage. That's the only wage they'll take. So could they just ask for my money, or were they actually a business? They could ask for a certain amount of money. Said, "Okay, I'll do this for it. It'll be eleven shillings a week." The guy says, "No, okay, I'll just do, I'll just go down the road here and ask somebody, ask the next guy to do it." Meanwhile, you've got this big crop you're trying to pull in, and nobody to do it for you, unless you're willing to pay eleven shillings a week. Otherwise, you lose everything. We see similar demands today of the American economy of people wanting higher wages. And for a lot of businesses, that's only going to make sense is, why are you going to pay your wor workers so little that they can't afford your product? For example, Walmart or McDonald's, someplace like that. Yeah, they need to make money. They pay, the corporation needs to pay their bills, but... You got millions of people working for McDonald's and Walmart. You want them making so little that they can't afford to buy anything from you? You want to write off those millions of customers? Yeah. And if you just raise their pay a little bit, that's how much more they'd be spending with you. That problem though is uh well it's kind of an unusual aspect of human nature is for some people, if you knock them down enough times, they'll stay down. Some people used to being at the bottom rung or not making money or being in poverty, sometimes they will just give up. And uh, sometimes uh, it'll be years between a company or somebody gives uh, their workers a raise. Claiming all sorts of reasons why. Uh, foreign competition, the uh, economy's bad, we just can't afford it right now. But when you keep working, making more and more sacrifices for your company, putting in more and more hours, taking more and more cuts, but really like watching the boss making millions and millions more, stockholders making millions and millions more, and you getting nothing, it comes to a point you they, it'll just stop, say, stop, enough of this. It's time for our share, too. And that's what happens here, supply and demand. Sometimes it does lead into wages too. It's why unions work, because they negotiate higher wages for their uh, for the union workers. All those thousands of workers get together and say, Look, we've done this for you, the company's making this, we want to cut too. We have all those professional workers who've done all this for you all these years, we just want our share. Henry Ford caused a scandal when he paid his workers so much above the industry average in the early 20th century. Way above what the other factory workers were making. Other automakers were upset with him about this, said he's going to ruin the market. Henry Ford said, no. I'm doing this because I've got all these people working in my factories, thousands of people. Those are customers. Henry Ford paid his workers enough they can afford to buy their own car, their own Ford. That helped put America on the road. Yeah, could he have made a lot more money off it? Yeah, but it's the point how much money do you need? A lot of people seem to forget the point of this is it's not to get rich, it's to yeah. give right. something to your community, uh, some kind yeah. of service. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And it comes to a point that no. <clears throat> A lot of business is competition. You want to be on top and do that. You want your customers, you want your employers to help keep you on top. Buying your own product, buying your own service. Um, and I say you've got just a point. So uh, you've got enough. Yeah, could I make more money? Could I cash in now? Yeah, you could, but 
It's one thing. I want to stay around and build something. I want to make something. Guys like Ford, whatever kind of flaws he had as a person otherwise, he wanted to stay and make something. And he did. So Thomas Edison, brilliant inventor, um, Edison General Electric, GE, he started that company. Uh, big, big power companies in uh, some of the cities back east, Consolidated Edison, Con Ed, his companies. The guy was a very rich man. He could cash in and sold everything, but he kept inventing. He kept developing more and more because he was curious. He had to build. He had to leave something. He had to make something. That's what made him a memorable figure. I read in my sociology book that a lot of American companies, companies that live in their business offshore because they can pay lower wages. Yeah. Did you accept that for other countries have different wage laws. Yeah, we have wage laws. They don't have a minimum wage in some countries. They don't have uh, workplace safety laws in those countries. So basically, they can pay slave labor, pay for slave labor, or they can pay to have children to put together your clothing. And sell their products here, and that's been the problem here for the yeah. last 20 years, though. That you know, usually we have used to, you used to have a lot of American factories, but. Over the last 20 years, a lot of these factories started moving out and going overseas, and that's the biggest thing in politics. Yeah, it's been even longer than that, since the early 80s. Why? Because <sighs> lobbyists, consultants, consultants go into this company, uh, they, well, what you need to do is you'll be making so much more money to move your company overseas. You won't have to pay your workers so much. Well, because those consultants were paid to tell them that. They benefited from it. No one else did. The company might be making a few extra dollars in the stock price, but what happens to that community where people who bought all the products that work they can't afford it anymore? Um, politicians for years, they've been giving tax cuts to companies to move their factories overseas. There are a lot of politicians trying to fight that, but there are just enough lobbyists and just enough donors to keep the people who are stopping that in power. I'll say one thing about it. They uh, cry it one day of loss of American jobs, but, don't, but uh, they won't tell the public because the public's not paying attention. They're paying these companies to do that. A lot of companies you see in here in Arkansas have closed down to go overseas. Yeah. Polishing a lot of communities in the process, meaning a lot of people can't afford their products anymore. Okay, and uh, the problem with so many people in America today is they don't want to hear the facts. They want someone to tell them what they think is true. They want affirmation. They don't want truth. The two are very different. Mm. Happens as a result. You have this increasing pop number of people in the United States who seriously and fiercely believe something that isn't true. And there are companies paying to put this information on TV and radio and everything else to tell them these things that just aren't true. Yeah, the information age is kind of like a double-edged. I'm sure you can learn a lot faster, but at the same time, you can hear a lot of the problem is people don't know how to sort fact from fiction. They want what's comfortable. Kind of insulting, I think, Yeah. And of course, the problem is some people really are. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we're here to learn. Okay, uh, example that's going here. Uh, between 1347 and 1353, here in England, Aristocratic incomes are down 20%. They have to do a lot of changes in their lifestyle because they aren't ready to, aren't ready to make. But they want things to go back to 1347, 1346. So, gathering these Statute of Laborers. English Parliament, 1351, passes a law saying that uh, all wages will return to pre-plague levels. 
Makes the turning clock back to 1347. Forbade the mobility of peasants from their manors. What happens as a result? Economic forces are outpacing of parliamentary edicts. There aren't enough people to keep people in the manners anymore. There aren't enough people to track them down. Uh, so wages do level off, but they aren't going back down. Uh, positions of the nobles as landlords deteriorates, the increasing number of peasants, the manorial system starts to die in England. People moved off, found other choices, built new lives, free from the manorial lord. They could name their price, they could name their position, they could come and go as they pleased. Total revolution of the English economy. In other countries, it's happening as well. May not to the extent it is in England, it's happening elsewhere as well. 1358, Jacques Arrivals. This is a peasant's revolt. Uh, now, the plague caused a lot of economic dislocation. That couple of the Hundred Years' War, all these mar armies marching back and forth over these fields, eating off the land, destroying farmland, caused a lot of hardships for these peasants. A lot of class tensions in the time after the plague, because they're facing the same economic forces. Fewer people in France. More of them trying to move off the manors, trying to demand higher wages, but the manorial lords in France trying to clamp down on it. So the peasants, having suffered so many years, the hands of these wars of the, for the aristocrats, lost so much from the plague, they've had enough. They rise up violently. Countless uh, manorial lords and aristocrats are murdered by uh, peasant armies going rampant, setting fire to uh, their stately homes and castles. This is happening all over the country. It's called Jacquerie uh, because the most common name for a peasant in this time period is Jacques. Jack. It means basically member of the commoners, Jacquerie. So it's chaos all over France. The peasants are up in arms, murdering nobles left and right. The upper classes realize what's happening, so they quickly close the ranks and uh, raise their armies and slaughter the rebels. Try to crush as many of them as they possibly can. Until eventually the Jacquerie revolt is uh, ended. Yeah, by the big kill. So basically, the Black Death resulted in economic tensions in France that resulted in the Civil War. Massive peasant revolts. How many casualties did there that number? Or, uh, they really don't know. I said thousands, maybe, but they really don't know. Except there weren't any markers or uh, some of your ports destroyed or disrupted. They just don't know how many. Revolts in cities such as uh, Ghent and Rouen, uh, 1380s, uh, peasants' rebellions against the upper classes. In England, peasants' revolt for us. It's called Lot Tyler's Rebellion. Really one of the leaders of the peasants' revolt, as it's called. What happens is 1381. I said it's 30 years after the statute of labor, and basically a generation is set in. And a generation of rising expectations. They're doing fairly well. They want to keep doing well. No reason why they should stop. Economic conditions are improving considerably after the plague for peasants. But every now and then you'll have these uh, aristocrats try to clamp down that. Try, still trying to turn the clock back before the plague. But the peasants aren't going back. Wage control measures have enraged peasants. So Attempts to reimpose feudal dues were made, raging the peasants. Things kind of a low simmer. 
So what happens is, Richard II, King of England, 1377-1399, tends to impose a poll tax on the people. Now, poll tax has a different meaning in uh, American history than it does in English. The poll tax only meaning a head tax. In the United States, late 1800s, or 1900s, meant basically a tax to vote. But peasants can't vote in the 14th century, in 14th century England. The poll tax basically shilling for every horse or a, a cow you own or for every person in the household over 18 or something like that. So basically, an onerous tax inflicted on them by uh, King Richard. Well, Eastern England, which is the wealthiest part of it, uh, peasants are enraged. They refuse to pay this uh, tax and they kicked out the collectors. They said, we're not going to do it. We're not going back again. But this time, they didn't just uh, kick out the tax collectors. They rose up with an army. So we're going to overthrow the king, we're going to government, and stop this nonsense once and for all. So there's a rebellion led by a man named Watt Tyler. Uh, now, I believe this movie was a preacher named John Ball. He's trying to add a moral dimension to this. Uh, one of his uh, uh, sermons basically was the fact that in the Garden of Eden, uh, there were no uh, titles. Titles weren't created by God. <coughs> titles were created by man to separate man. And essentially, this whole thing was they're tired of being pushed down because they're peasants. I mean, taxed to death because they're peasants trying to be pushed back into this little corner. And the peasant rebels are going to overthrow this government. What ultimately they're trying to decide on, we're not sure. Maybe a kind of socialist state or Christian socialist state, we're not exactly sure. They weren't really clear on the demands. But what happened, though, was 1381, the monarchy was knocked back on its heels. Forces were being hurled back. Kings. Uh, they ended up taking over London, pushing the king out further west. And finally, Richard II rides up to them um, and promises Watt Tyler and his peasant army that if they disperse, go back to their homes, he will agree to their demands. So basically, you go home, I'll do what you, I'll do what you ask. Just leave me alone, I'll do it. Here's the problem. They had him on the ropes. They had him right where they wanted him. And they agreed. They gave up the one advantage they had over him, dispersed and left. That's the only Alexander over in, uh, in uh, India. Yeah. So just kept going. So what happens here is Richard II, now this rebel army is dispersed. Now he pulls together what's left of his army and goes after him. <laughs> Gathers as many as the rebel leaders they can find, hangs them for treason, and afterward quietly eliminates the poll tax. Mm -hmm. Peasants' rebellion is over, but the, uh, like the same economic conditions are still in place. The people are still rising. Uh, they, uh, people still have these rising economic expectations, still doing fairly well. Richard II is unpopular as ever, and 1399 is overthrown and assassinated. Not at all missed. Christian sect is overthrown by overthrown by Henry the Fourth. I think in Italy. Remember Caccio's to Cameron talking about uh, the, a plague in the city of Florence. They were hit very hard by it. Well, they had a has their own peasants rebellion in uh, 1378. Chompy. Chompy is kind of a nickname for the local woolen workers. Basically, their job is to take wool and make it into cloth. It's a kind of primitive factory condition. They're factory workers. Providing a valuable skill for Florence, which is uh, exporting cloth to the rest of Europe. So it's not making knives like we conceive of today, but 
They're making a very nice living on it. Florence is making a very nice living off their work. But the thing is, though, woolen's production is down two-thirds since uh, 1350. Why? Customers are dead. A yeah, little fact there. So they basically go on strike, demand higher wages, the right to form their own guilds. Basically, I don't know if I've earlier, guilds like an early uh, labor union of sorts. So, right to form their own association of workers to uh, establish standards within their own profession how to train people within their own profession, and how to set uh, wages and prices for the services they offer. It's the right form of guild, the wages, and plus the right to right participate in the local government. Florence is a republic. It's an aristocratic republic, but it's a republic. Small, it's basically the best city in the surrounding area. So basically they're riding all the city, and eventually the the uh, Republic gives in and says, okay, get your demands, your wages, your guild, and your vote. So they're very happy with this for a while. But, uh, and going back to the question, why do these things happen? Why are people trying to keep people from getting ahead in life? Why do people allow these uh, problems to continue? Basically, they have a vested interest in keeping things the way they are. Eating interests, one of them has to win out in the end. And the uh, aristocrats who ran Florence, and that's where Paul basically still have the rich basically in charge. They decide they aren't going to give in. They can sit back for a while, bide their time, and strike when the time's right. So in 1382, the aristocrats organized a counter revolution, which undid all the gains by the Chompy. They lost their guild, lost their wages, kicked out of the government. Well, now we go back. France before the plague, the Hundred Years' War. It all has to do with the quest in the for power. Now if you've got here in thirteen thirty seven there's an ambitious king in England and an ambitious king in France. The two are related, they are cousins. But they don't like each other. <laughs> You understand about European history, the monarchies and government system. <coughs> These kings and princes and everybody, barons, dukes, they're all related to each other. The royal family tree in Europe doesn't work. It's like it's West Virginia or Alabama or something. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. And um, exit. Next week, you're going to be all going to be gathering for Thanksgiving, your families, maybe relatives and cousins you haven't seen in years, and of course, they're going to be having those arguments they've had for mm -hmm. the last 20, 30 years. It's the same thing here. Imagine everyone coming over uh, for Thanksgiving, but everyone bringing their own army with them. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you see, because the intermarriage is between... Uh, royal families in England and France, and because uh, William of Normandy had conquered England in 1066, they can, uh, the English believed they had a claim on the French throne, because William of Normandy was also in line of succession to the throne of France as well. By the 14th century, the English, seeing their opportunities, trying to lay claim to it. For serious alliances, marriages, and a couple of wars, they think they can end up being the dominant force and control all of Western Europe. France, what is now Spain, England, Scotland, Ireland, could all be theirs. Just a few little obstacles in their way. 
So you have Philip VI of France and Edward III of England. The French king had died. Philip had the leverage and the mobility and seizes the throne. Even though Edward, who had just seized the throne, taken the throne in England, also claims it. Well, England has a lot of claims to different territories in uh, France. Uh, in Eng in uh, France, it's got to remember one thing about kings is they aren't don't you don't have just one job or one title. Because of inheritances and uh, land claims and everything, they have several titles. So. Edward III, King of England, is also the Duke of uh, Normandy and the Duke of Gascony. Normandy, Northern France, Gascony, and southeastern, southwestern France. Should be a picture in here. I got a page 318. Gascony, see there in the bright orange on the right, but it's, I think, go back to the earlier territory. English kings actually corresponded and spoke French. More often spoke English. English was more of a language for the commoners and the peasants. And the English that spoke at that time was radically different from English spoken today. Still Middle English, a lot of different uh, local dialects. Well, Philip fears what the Edward III could kind of threaten could be to his uh, throne. Um, France is not nearly the power it was on Charlemagne, been divided, subdivided so many times. So Edward decided, so Philip decides to make a preemptive strike against Edward before Edward could do anything. So 1337, he see, uh, Philip seizes Gascony. Launching. Yeah. But he's based in London. It's basically one of the far flung territories he gets to every so often, but not very often. So, this is the excuse Edward III needs, and he launches what comes to be the Hundred Years War, which is actually a series of different wars. It's all in the last over 100 years. Basically, over an English, between England and France, over the control of France itself. Nobles are fighting either as not, uh, enthusiastically as knights, but to uh, England basically armed its peasants to fight as an infantry. Basically, with pitchforks and uh, swords and pikes, they basically uh, go out against the uh, greatly, uh, un uh, they greatly outnumber the uh, uh, French knights. Now, the pikes will slowly advance. Basically, a pike is like a six or eight foot uh, metal stick. They basically stick to the ground and uh, push forward, not riding on horseback. The horse or the rider itself. <laughs> yeah, it's gory, it's bloody, but that's warfare. It is gory and bloody by definition. Let's see why they use it? It works. The English also came out with another uh, innovation this time period uh, the Welsh longbow. Now, these crossbows, these kind of small uh, bows, Basically, already pulled back. They can aim it much easier and just launch the arrow at somebody. But uh, the Welsh longbow is a little different. It's about oh six feet tall. This big old bow. You pull back and release the arrow with all this force. The force of the arrow is enough that it can actually penetrate armor. Close enough range. Much greater range. Much deadlier, very accurate. And that's going to end up being a problem for the French. The French have hired mercenaries because so they don't have a large infantry. It's costing the French a lot of money. The English relying on peasantry, relying on the knights. This is really the last war in which you see knights in shining armor as a significant portion of the military force. The last really medieval wars. Well, uh, Edward III was uh, very adept, a skilled uh, fighter. Um, 
1346, he got the jump on the uh, on the French and uh, defeated them in the Battle of Cressy, 1346. Overwhelming defeat at uh, this battle. Basically, all he needed at this point was just march into Paris and seize the country. The French were defeated, but he was unable to take advantage of his position, unable to move forward. In 1346, guess what's happening? Next year, the plague hits. They have to cancel the war. <laughs> the English almost had them. <laughs> well, it's a plague. Uh, a little bit of fighting here and there after the plague. Um, basically, off and on the next uh, 30, 40 years, there's a little bit of interne intermittent fighting. One of the sad things about the plague, though, was Edward III's daughter, the princess, was a uh, engaged to be married to the uh, king of Aragon. So Spain wasn't a unified kingdom yet. Aragon was one of the major pieces of what would become Spain, basically the eastern half of it. And basically, through that uh, claim, his daughter would, uh, their son would be a king of Aragon and also king of England and king of France and king of Ireland. So one marriage, one victory, and one war. All of Western Europe belongs to England. In fact, even long after this war, the still official title of King of England was King of England, England, France, and Ireland. Well, um, about 1396, they agreed to a truce and the blasting for 20 years. Then 1450, you have a new king on the throne, Henry V, succeeding his father, Henry IV. He's overthrown by Henry V's death. Henry V is young, an energetic, uh, Later, very ambitious. He wants to claim the French throne once and for all. At least he can do it too. It very nearly does. He's a young man, still in his 20s, excellent military tactician, takes the fight to the French. King of France at this time is Charles VI. In 1380, 13 to 1422. <coughs> Problem Charles VI, completely insane. Mm. Weak, confused, completely at odds with reality. Mm. Why did the French nobles keep him on the throne? Because he can be manipulated. Mm. They can do whatever they want as long as Charles VI is on the throne. They can tell him whatever he wants to hear. <laughs> well, um, causes a considerable problem, though, because uh, you have a lot of these dudes, they want to put more something greater. Uh, Henry V is making a headway, and uh, Basically, control of France is coming down to these two men, the Duke, Duke of Orleans and the Duke of Burgundy, real power brokers in the country. Henry V has allied with the Duke of Burgundy, and his forces are taking over large chunks of uh, northern, uh, northern France, basically the northern half of France. They're retaking Gascony. And, of course, the Duke of Burgundy has a lot of French nobles behind him. Call themselves the Burgundians. Follows the Duke of Orleans supporting a French king for the French throne. Although he's insane, that means they can't get rid of him. Uh, they're called the Armaniacs. Well, Henry is uh, making headway here. Introducing uh, makes a tremendous battle, battle progress in battle Asian. This is where the Welsh longbow really makes a difference. 
Prince rides in battle, 1,500 noblemen on horseback as knights. The Welsh longbow. Welsh archers are firing their longbows at the uh, uh, knights, penetrating the armors, knocking them off their horses, and just flattening right on the ground. And as they char keep charging forward, more waves of these knights falling on top of the others. Their face plates are in the mud, they can't move. A lot of them are suffocating. Some uh, some are killed outright by the arrows, but a lot of them fall to the ground and suffocate. More of course, more of their fellow knights pancake on top of them. Basically, this wipe out wipes out the French nobility. All these young uh, knights killed in battle, the core of their leadership. Yeah, England uh, has wiped out the French nobility here at Asian Corps. Huge victory for them. And basically, the country is going to be theirs for the taking. France ultimately ruled in, but England went to the Battle of Asian Corps. The English who killed these French nobles. Henry V is an English king. Charles VI is French king. And uh, England, under Henry V, has just won the Battle of Asian Corps. Now this pretty much ends the uh, age of a uh, knights on horse, uh, the knights in shining armor in battle, battle of Asian Corps. The English have reconquered Normandy. The Allied Duke of Burgundy. England controls northern France. Paris falls to Eng Paris falls to the English hands. The English occupying the capital. So the French forces are moving south. Steadily and extremely south. It's probably though the point that Charles VI realizes there is nothing more he can do, so he signs a treaty with Charles with uh, Henry V. Basically, in this treaty, Henry V agrees to marry his daughter, and uh, actually, it's very nice looking. So, it wasn't a bad thing. Um, <laughs> And when Charles VI dies, Henry V will become King of France. And uh, Charles VI's grandson, Henry V's son, will then become King of France as well. So England basically wins. They're so basically going to wind down the world. Well, Henry still has some mopping up to do. The Armagnacs still putting up a lot of resistance in parts of portions of central France. But. Henry V gets sick and dies. 35 years old, has a nine month old son. Uh, basically, poor sanitary conditions on the battlefield led to Henry getting sick and dying. So basically, it goes to Thorne, and then it goes to Henry VI. Little baby? Yeah. They have what they call Regency in place. So basically, he's the king, but other people might have it. Other people make decisions for him. Charles VI dies a few months later. Mm. Wait, is that the, that's yeah. the baby? No, Charles, Henry VI is the baby. Okay, okay, okay. Charles VI is his grandfather. Now, Henry's married his daughter, and uh, this is now the king of England. The treaty held up. He would have been king of France, too, but Charles VI still lived. He outlived Henry V. And how did he die? Old age, just natural causes. So he dies in 1422, just a few months after Henry does. Well, by the treaty, Henry VI should have been king of France, but the Armagnacs say, no, we're going to stay within the. He's Charles VI's son, who rules Charles VII. Still a law for Problem for Henry VI, though, the mental illness is afflicting Charles VI, it's hereditary. Uh, That's me problem when he grows up. We'll get that more next time. But basically, the whole thing of the Hundred Years' War is England delivers a lot of devastating defeats to the to the French, but can never quite deliver that knockout punch. So France stays independent. I'll finish up the war next time. Talk about the uh, problems of the church. Read chapters 11 and 12 for next time. There's nothing more. I bid you do.